Okay, welcome back everyone. Let's uh, take a quick minute and uh, review uh, what we looked at in the last lecture. Um, the, the first thing we, we talked about, or one, one of the last things really we talked about, was this concept of the nuclear model of the atom, which we see over on the uh, right-hand side, in which uh, our three uh, subatomic particles, um, two of them, the protons and the neutrons, live in the nucleus of the atom, and uh, electrons uh, sort of in a thin veil surround that nucleus of, uh, of the atom, uh, which, which is our, our currently understood description of uh, the model of the atom, uh, which we see here. We moved uh, uh, forward and we said that uh, every, regarding elements, every atom of uh, different elements are, are different from one another, meaning they have a different number of protons, neutrons, and electrons. And these uh, elements, you know, about 115, 120 of them, are arranged or rather listed in a particular fashion, in that of the periodic table. In many ways, uh, or in a, a few ways anyways, we started to unlock the, uh, the, the secrets of the shape of the periodic table. We will continue to do that uh, for the remainder of this unit of study and into the next unit of study. Um, but it is a, a, a method of listing all of the elements, pure substances, that, uh, that exist in, in, in a way that we can, uh, we can work with them. Um, one pattern that emerges uh, in the placing of the elements in the periodic table is with respect to the columns. Uh, the, what, the, so the elements in uh, the same column of the periodic table bear similar reactivity, although we haven't defined that yet, and that is uh, termed periodicity, which we defined last time, which is, so again, similar reactivity in elements in the same vertical column of the periodic table, and that is more pronounced on the columns on the periphery, the outside of the periodic table, more so, as we'll find, than as we look at elements on the, uh, as we go to the inside of the periodic table. This diagram over on the right is sort of a, a cutout of the S block and some of the P block of the periodic table um, because our model of reactivity is only going to work uh, for the most part within the S block and the P block, and as we'll see uh, moving forward. Um, uh, speaking of block nomenclature, uh, we have now, or we listed to end the last uh, lecture, four ways of deconstructing the periodic table based upon differences. Um, the, those four were the block nomenclature, which I just referred to, P block, uh, S block, D block, F block. We also separated it, uh, the periodic table based upon metals versus nonmetals. Uh, what we termed main group versus transition elements. And within the main group, some we had certain colloquial names for various columns that we went over uh, uh, at the end of the last lecture. So we've talked a lot about atoms of elements, atoms being the uh, smallest indivisible particle of an element. One assumption, which we're, uh, you know, which we're going to get into now, uh, is that uh, when we term an atom of an element, we're, uh, we're discussing a, a neutral species, a neutral species, meaning it does not have a charge associated with it. Since electrons carry the negative charge in an atom and protons carry the positive charge, in every atom that we're discussing, there must be an equal number of protons and electrons to cancel out all those charges to zero. Now we're going to start to look at uh, an atom and, and, and discuss it, uh, a, a, whether it had uh, lost or gained one or more electrons, giving an imbalance in charge, giving it an overall positive or negative electric charge. If we have an imbalance in the number of electrons and protons, there, there is going to be uh, an excess of one, so that, uh, that, that, that uh, particle will have a charge on it. These, charge, these charged particles are known as ions. Ions. An, an, an ion is an atom or molecule, we'll stick with an atom, uh, which has lost or gained one or more electrons, giving it a positive or negative electrical charge. Notice here, lost or gained more than one electrons. Electrons, not protons, not neutrons. They live in the nucleus, they never move. Electrons can uh, come into an atom, leave an atom. They're the ones with the mobility. So we're going to be seeing more and more of that later. So some housekeeping on ions. Um, th th what we're seeing here, I don't want you to worry about the, the nomenclatures we see here. 
uh, uh, you know, what, what these names are. We will get to them uh, eventually, but don't worry about that now. Um, one, of the main, uh, one of the main concerns with an ion is whether it is positively charged or negatively charged, positively or negatively. So a negatively charged ion is known as an anion. A positively charged ion is known as a cation. So uh, dependent upon that imbalance in protons and electrons, we can have a negatively charged uh, overall charge, uh, that, that of an anion, uh, and, uh, or a positively, or positive overall charge, that of a cation. So what I would like uh, us uh, to take a look at now, or to understand, is, is looking at the ways of depicting the ions themselves. You know, how do we uh, sh sh show a, a difference in, uh, you know, a difference in in, uh, in the element, but also a difference in charge? Now, I am taking some license here. We have some chemical symbols here over on the upper left-hand side. Cl, well, that's chlorine. Uh, o is oxygen. Na is sodium. Ca is calcium, and so on. We'll We'll be getting used to these. Uh, the more we use them, we'll be able to say, okay, that the Ca is calcium, Cl is chlorine. But what I would really want to uh, look at right now are the positioning of the charges. How do we show that in, we, we don't have an atom anymore, but rather an ion? And if we do have an ion, what charge is that, positive or negative? Or how many of those positive or negative charges? Well, here's some basic rules down on the bottom here. Notice in all cases, if we're depicting an ion, the ionic charge is always placed as a superscript. Uh, that's uh, slightly above, as we know, like, you know, in, in the exponent region, if this were a number or something like that, it's always in a superscript. Uh, along with that uh, superscript, if, uh, if it's a single ionic charge, whether uh, positive or negative, um, we, uh, we give that charge, plus or minus, without a number. So, for instance, the sodium cation would be Na+, plus, not Na1+. Plus. That would be wrong. So, it's important to get that right. If it's a single ionic charge, it's just that charge. Multiple ionic charges uh, we give uh, as, as follows. So, if we look over on the, uh, the, the right-hand side, here, this superscript on oxygen is two minus, so that's a, a doubly negative anion. On calcium here below it, that, uh, that is a doubly positive ionic charge. Notice it is calcium two plus, not calcium plus two. That's a common mistake. And uh, by the convention is the number first and then the charge. It may seem trivial at this point, but it, it is a, uh, a necessity to, to know that. So enough of the descriptive qualities of, of ions. Um, what about the practical utility of knowing uh, the charge on a, a particular ion? If we know the number of protons in an ion and the number of, of electrons, we can very easily uh, calculate the ionic charge on that particle. And it's, it's always the number of protons minus the number of electrons. A couple of examples. It's, uh, what is the charge on a magnesium ion with 10 electrons? Okay, we know the number of electrons, but what is the number of protons? The number of protons in magnesium isn't given in this problem. However, we can go to the periodic table and look for the chemical symbol of magnesium. Find it, it's Mg, we find it, and what is that number right on top of it? That number on top of it is the atomic number, and that is always the number of protons. So hiding in plain sight, as long as we know that Mg is the chemical symbol of magnesium, we are able to uh, go to the periodic table. There's more information, helpful information in there than you would think, and be able to then correctly put in uh, the 12 protons, the atomic number from that uh, magnesium, magnesium from the periodic table, minus the given 10 electrons, and that gives us 2 plus, a, two, a plus 2 cationic charge on magnesium. Similarly, same sort of question, what is the charge on a fluorine ion with 10 electrons? Well, we have that uh, piece right there. That's the number of electrons. What's the number of protons that we need to calculate our ionic charge? Well, we go, we go no further than a periodic table, 
find the chemical symbol for fluorine, which is F, and look at that number right on top of that chemical symbol. That would be the number nine. That is the atomic number. It is also the number of protons in a nucleus of fluorine. Always nine minus 10 is a single negative charge, and thus uh, calculation of ionic charge in these sorts of questions becomes elementary. Okay, so here is where we are going to look at another, yet another pattern in the periodic table, and it's also where I am going to uh, ask you to bear with me. To take, I'm going to take a little license here as to we're going to be looking at specifically predicting ions from main group elements. Main group elements uh, being, of course, the uh, the S block and the P block. Not all of them, but some of them. So our model, as I've said before, works with S block and P block elements, but not so with, uh, with transition elements. Transition elements form ions, rather cations, because they, they lose electrons in chemical reactions, they are metals, um, with, it says here, various charges. That means our model that I'm going to be showing you in this course does not predict the charges on, uh, on uh, transition metals or transition elements. That doesn't mean they're inherently unpredictable. It just means the model we're using is only going to be with the S block and the P block. So let's look at this pattern uh, right now. Uh, we know any metals we look at are going to be positively charged cations. How do I know that? Because as we said before, metals tend to lose electrons, which carry the negative charge, in chemical reactions. If we, a neutral atom of a metal loses some of its negative charge, it must be positive, end up being positively charged. So metals are always positive ions, and that's what's what we're going to go with. But let's look at this. Let's look at the, uh, at the alkali metals. The alkali metals are always singly positively charged. That's a predictable ion that we can go with. The reasoning for this, we're going to find out in the next unit of study. But for right now, we're eight, we're, if we can remember that first column on the left on the periodic table, the alkali metals singly uh, positively charged. Moving over one to our alkaline earth metals, always doubly positive charged. Two plus, two plus all the way down, as we can see. Now we start to see a pattern emerge from alkali metals, one plus, over to uh, alkaline earth metals, two plus. Is there any other metals that we can look at within the S and P block? Well, let's, again, that means we're skipping over the D block, the transition elements. And let's look here now. Well, there's a, a column of metals, a column of metals, and uh, aluminum being the main one that, that we see that we see up here. Aluminum and gallium, uh, if you want, but we'll be working with al aluminum uh, more often. Three plus, three plus. Now this pattern now emerges, uh, and you can look at it any number of ways. If we count over from the left-hand side, we can, well, how many uh, blocks did I uh, go over? Well, if I go through one block, that's plus one. If I travel through two blocks, that's plus two. If I travel through three blocks, remember we're skipping the transition metals, well, that's plus three. That's a pattern. One, two, three, all to the positive. Let's go look at the other side of the periodic table, the right-hand side. And I should say, and I'm going to reiterate again, that these predictable ions form more, much more readily on the columns on the periphery of the periodic table, on the outside. As we move inside, we still get some predictability, but it's not as predictable, meaning other considerations take over. But for the most part, uh, what's listed here are predictable. Okay, right-hand side. Let's take a look. All the way to the right, uh, the column there is our noble gases. Our noble gases, helium, neon, argon, etc., they don't form ions. That's significant. That is significant because uh, we're going to find that the, uh, the electron configuration, how a, uh, a noble gas is put together, is very, very stable. It, uh, it is not, does not have an impetus to gain or lose an electron ever. So they don't form, they're, they're happy, if, you, if I take a human term to it, they are happy 
as they are, with the, the exact number of protons, electrons, etc. They don't form ions. Okay, let's look at the column just to the left of the noble gases. We had a colloquial name for that, if you'll remember. Those were the halogens. And the halogens uh, all tend to form single negatively charged anions. At fluorine becomes F minus, that's minus one. Chlorine becomes Cl minus, minus one. Bromine, Br minus. Iodine, I minus. All of these uh, we now have a pattern for. It's always singly negative charged anions. Moving over another column. Let's look at this here. Oxygen, sulfur, selenium, two minus. That's, uh, that, you know, if we know one, we can predict them all. And we'll be in this, uh, these successions absolutely have patterns. Moving over another column, nitrogen and phosphorus, three minus. Well, now that a pattern is really emerging here, and let's look at that. We start uh, going over one block from the right, zero. Next block into the halogens, minus one. Next block uh, into this column with oxygen and sulfur, minus two. Next block into nitrogen and phosphorus column, minus three. Zero, minus one, minus two, minus three, going from right to left. Going from left to right, if you remember, is there is no zero, but it's plus one, plus two ions, and skipping the transition metals, plus three. So really, it's not rote memorization for this, and it, uh, it, it's basically following a pattern. And that pattern, we're going to find, uh, has a meaning to it, meaning uh, in the next unit of study, as I said before, um, we're going we're, we're to devise a model which shows this. So um, a couple of the uh, sum summarizing points we can take from here. The transition elements do not have predictable charges, meaning we simply don't, aren't putting putting in the time to create a model for, for them, and that noble gases don't form ions. We have no uh, desire to lose electrons or gain, electro gain electrons. They're fine exactly as they are. And the, the model that we're going to be looking at in the next unit of study is going to explain that more. So we're going to shift gears somewhat uh, and, and hearken back to something we looked at in a previous lecture, and that was with respect to what is the appropriate unit of mass measure for molecules, atoms, or subatomic particles. Previously, when we had introduced subatomic particles, we had given them given their mass in the ridiculously large uh, uh, units of measure of kilograms. And we said that uh, the subatomic particles are on the order of uh, 10 to the minus 27th kilograms, something infinitesimally small, unimaginably small with respect to kilograms. So there is no uh, unit of mass measure that's up to this point that has been appropriately small enough to measure the mass of an atom or a subatomic particle. So again, we had to come up with another yardstick. And that yardstick, was the basis of that yardstick was a carbon atom. A carbon atom. Why carbon? Well, uh, organic chemistry and essentially the chemistry of life is based upon the element carbon. So perhaps that's why it was chosen. Um, a few salient features about a carbon atom that we're going to get uh, move towards because we're going to introduce what is uh, known uh, uh, as the atomic mass unit or AMU, if you will is that first of all, a carbon atom, as we see a picture over on the left hand here, has 12 nucleons. Now these are particles, subatomic particles, which live in the nucleus. And as we know, those are only protons and neutrons. They are collectively considered, if you'd like, nucleons because they live in the nucleus. Now this carbon atom also has six electrons surrounding that, uh, that nucleus, but if you'll remember, the mass of an electron was on the order of a 10,000th of that of a nucleon, a proton or a neutron. And a proton and a neutron weigh almost exactly the same, we find. They're about the exact same mass. So uh, while we have 12 nucleons in uh, our carbon nucleus, we consider the mass uh, of the electrons to be insignificant, completely insignificant. If there's six electrons, that's six ten thousandths of an atomic mass unit. 
in this uh, model, in this, uh, in this yardstick, we consider that insignificant. So the statement was made that one carbon atom weighs exactly 12 atomic mass units. Thus, since we have 12 nucleons, a proton or a, or a neutron, since they weigh about the same, uh, can be said to weigh approximately, and it's not exact, it's approximately one atomic mass unit. Fair enough. So let's, uh, let's move a little bit further and we'll look at uh, uh, carbon as given in the periodic table. So over here on the lower left-hand side, we have our description of carbon as given in the periodic table. And on the number on top of the chemical symbol, we have as our atomic number. That's the number of protons in its nucleus. And indeed, we see that up here, six protons. It defines the element. If I don't have six protons in my nucleus, I am not an atom of carbon. I'm something else. Now, down here on the bottom, this is something I pushed off till later. It's the atomic mass of our element, in this case of carbon. Uh, is given as uh, abbreviated as uppercase M. And we have here about is 12. We see 12 right there on, on the bottom. And 12 is because we have six protons and six neutrons that weigh almost exactly uh, uh, one AMU. But we also have something else. Look over here. We have one on the order of one one hundredth. 12.01. 12.01, that's going to be a problem. Ultimately, if we want to look at any atomic mass, which we see here, uh, we could make the statement that an element's atomic mass is its mass in atomic mass units. So 12.011 down on the bottom here of carbon means that a carbon atom or this depiction of a carbon atom weighs 12.011 atomic mass units. Fair enough. My problem, however, is that if a, pro a proton and a neutron weighs almost exactly one AMU, why do we have a little overage here? Why isn't carbon's atomic mass exactly 12 AMU? Because one atomic mass unit equals exactly one twelfth that of a carbon atom. Now you could say, well, this is the mass of the electrons. It's the mass of the electrons uh, which comes up, which gives us this extra mass 12.01, that one one hundredth of an atomic mass unit. However, remember, we have six electrons, six electrons around carbon. They all weigh on the order of about a 10,000th. That's 10 to the minus four of an atomic mass unit. Looking down here, one one hundredth of an atomic mass unit dwarfs that number. So it can't, so that 0 0.01 atomic mass units is far too much energy, or I'm sorry, mass to account for, to account for that extra mass on there. So the question is, why isn't carbon's atomic mass exactly 12 AMU? Well, let's take a look at the next slide. The answer is isotopes. Isotopes, by definition, are atoms of an element which contain different numbers of neutrons different numbers of neutrons. That's that third subatomic particle, the neutron, which, which lives within the nucleus, uh, which we haven't talked about a lot. Now we know two atoms of the same element must have the same number of protons because the number of protons in an atom defines the element. We further know that an atom of an element can lose or gain electrons at will becoming ions, whether cations or anions. Now we're talking about uh, atoms of an element uh, which have different numbers of neutrons. So let's look at some salient features about what are considered isotopes. In a naturally occurring sample of almost any element, there is a distribution of different isotopes, which means if I have a sample of carbon here and a sample of carbon there, there'll be the same ratio of the number of atoms of one isotope to another to another always in a naturally occurring sample. As, as before, it means that 
will always have the same number of protons in those atoms because they're all carbon, but a different number of neutrons. So how do we express this new uh, idea of different particles? Even though they're the two atoms of carbon, they're different particles. If they have two different numbers of neutrons, well, they weigh differently. They, 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 they have different masses. Well, we can illustrate this using what are called isotopic symbols. And I want to define the isotopic symbol before we move ahead and look at it uh, in, on more of a piecemeal basis and describe it a little bit more. A general isotopic symbol has at its heart this uh, general depiction here, where over on the right-hand side, given as X, is the chemical symbol. Again, if it's carbon, it's C, if it's oxygen, it is uh, O, and so on and so forth. So we're, we're fairly uh, adept at that. But on the left-hand side of an isotopic symbol are a stack of two numbers, given as M and Z, which we see right here, but, it's, but they're stacked always. And I will say that that stack is always top-heavy, meaning that uh, the M is always a greater number than Z, and we're going to see why. So let's define this. Let's look on the, uh, the stack of numbers. We'll start at the bottom first, because that gives us some information that's already in the periodic table. Z. Z was our atomic number, if you'll remember. That's given on any periodic table, our atomic number. And the atomic number depicts how many protons are in the nucleus, always. So we immediately have that number. So the lower number on that stack of numbers in an isotopic symbol is essentially the atomic number. It's the number of protons that that, that uh, uh, atom of the element has. And it always has to be the same number of protons or it's not that element anymore since it's a defining feature. The top number is what is new. And that is given as the mass number, the mass number. Now the mass number given as uh, capital M here is the total number of nucleons, nucleons. Remember, I defined a nucleon as the, the uh, total, um, or as, as a subatomic particle which lives in the nucleus. That's protons and neutrons, protons and neutrons uh, in the nucleus. So very quickly, if given an isotopic symbol, we can, uh, we can immediately deduce the number of protons, that's given as the atomic number, but also the number of neutrons by subtracting that bottom number from the top number. Number of protons and neutrons minus number of protons equals number of neutrons. So there's a lot of information we're able to glean from an isotopic symbol. So let's get out of the general description or, or depiction, if you will, and look at some actual isotopic symbols. Here's a couple of them. Uh, over on the left-hand side, we see chlorine, uh, Cl. That's the elemental symbol for chlorine. And here we have a couple numbers stacked on the, on the left-hand side. We have a 17 there and a 35 there. The 17 on the bottom is the atomic number, Z. That means 17 protons. I can immediately uh, work that out. The top number is the mass number. Uh, that is the number of nucleons, number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So we're very, by subtracting 17 from 35, we can easily come up with the number of, uh, <clears throat> of, of neutrons uh, in that particular isotope. Remember, we can have different isotopes. Another isotope of chlorine might have a different mass number up here, which would mean there's a different number of neutrons. And we'll look at some examples of that as we move along. Same sort of thing over here on the, uh, the right-hand side. Lithium, Li, is its elemental symbol. We have atomic number three, that's three protons. Mass number seven, that's the number of nucleons, neutrons plus protons, seven uh, nucleons minus three protons equals four neutrons in that particular uh, in that particular isotope. Now, so these are the, the way of drawing and expressing isotopic symbols. There is a, a phonetic way of defining uh, or descri a more descriptive term, I'll say, for these isotopic symbols. If you look on the bottom here, the, we, we can express these by their mass number. So this particular isotope given in a drawing sense here of, 
of, of chlorine is given as this isotope is known as chlorine 35. Chlorine 35. So we, the elemental symbol Cl means chlorine, and 35 means its mass number, which implies the number of neutrons. We don't have a specific number for a number of neutrons in an isotopic symbol, but it implies that. So this would be chlorine 35. Our isotope of, of uh, lithium over here, Li, is lithium. So we find that this would be lithium-7 for that particular isotope. Lithium-7, because that mass number 7 up top is what is expressed in that descriptive term. So let's look at an example of a naturally occurring sample of an element, and we'll stick with carbon. Any naturally occurring sample of carbon will have a specific isotopic distribution. And here we see uh, uh, we've got an elemental symbol here. It doesn't have to be uh, sort of ensconced in, in that uh, black package there. But that this is carbon, the, the elemental symbol of carbon over on the right hand side, our stack of numbers on the left, uh, you know, the mass number and the atomic number. Now, in a naturally occurring sample of carbon, uh, we have uh, a predominant, this isn't always the case, but in this case, a very predominant isotope, and that would be carbon-12, meaning, uh, as we, we can uh, work this out, of course, as we did in the last slide, six protons, six neutrons, has to be. We know that carbon has six uh, protons, so the extra six up here in the mass number, that must be uh, six neutrons. So carbon-12 in any naturally occurring sample of carbon comprises 99% of the sample. Fair enough, 99% of the sample. But in any naturally occurring sample of carbon, there's also uh, another isotope, and that is given as carbon-13, given by this mass number 13 up top here, which is different than carbon-12. We, from it, we can glean that we have one additional neutron in there. It's always six protons, but now we have seven neutrons because 13 minus six is in fact seven. Now, carbon-13 in any naturally occurring sample of carbon always comprises approximately 1% of the sample. Fair enough. We have 99% of the sample and 1% of the sample corresponding to carbon-12 and carbon-13 uh, respectively. Lastly, in any naturally occurring sample of carbon, we always have a vanishingly small amount of another isotope, and that would be carbon-14. That is, as before, always six protons, because that's carbon, but two additional neutrons from carbon-12, eight neutrons added together, gives the mass number of 14, carbon-14. That comprises about one-tenth of one percent of the sample. Um, I say about uh, because it, it always has to add up to 100. But what we have here now is uh, are, are the three major isotopes of carbon, but they always exist in any naturally occurring sample of carbon. Here's just a table showing uh, some, uh, some representative uh, uh, standard distributions of isotopes in, in, different, in different elements. If we look at, for instance, uh, we have here two helium isotopes, um, uh, in one which uh, has uh, uh, three nucleons, one has an extra neutron, four nucleons over here on the left-hand side. Look at this distribution. Almost the entirety of that helium uh, is, uh, is, is in one isotopic form and a very, very vanishingly small amount is in another isotopic form. Uh, that isn't always the case. We'll look at some differences, but, uh, but that's mostly the case. If we look at the major isotopes of oxygen down here on the lower left-hand side, uh, uh, oxygen 16, 17, and 18, we'll notice that in our uh, uh, abundances within that naturally occurring sample, we have one of them which is, comprises the vast majority of this, that sample, just like we did with uh, our, our, our carbon. So no, over 99% of a sample of oxygen is oxygen-16. Very small amounts account for oxygen-17 and oxygen-18. That was exactly the same sort of thing we saw for carbon, but that occurs in any naturally occurring sample of uh, oxygen. 
Notice on these that we have uh, uh, two numbers given for, for each isotope. Down here on this particular isotope of oxygen, we have its abundance in percent, 0.205% of the sample, but we also have the mass and very, very uh, accurate mass in atomic mass units of that particular isotope. In this case, 17.999 uh, and so on. So that's going to become important when we start talking about the actual meaning of atomic mass. Now, most elements, almost all elements, have a natural distribution of isotopes. That's not always the case. Uh, in very few uh, uh, instances, there is an, uh, an element which only has one isotope. Very, very rare, though. One example would be fluorine. Fluorine, as we can see here, has 100% of that sample. 100% of that sample uh, is one isotope. We see that 100 over here on the upper right-hand side. Um, so uh, fluorine is one of the rare cases where we have only uh, one isotope in a naturally occurring sample. The other thing we noticed in a, a couple of the uh, examples we saw that uh, in cases where we do have a distribution of, uh, of isotopes, uh, one isotope uh, most of the time comprises the vast majority of the sample. That's not always the case. Good example might be chlorine, which has two major isotopes here, chlorine 35 and chlorine 37. Uh, notice this distribution. So in percentages, uh, in, in a naturally occurring sample of chlorine, well, it's, it's sort of mixed now. 75% of it is one isotope, and a full quarter of it is another isotope. So really what we have here, not I guess one of the uh, isotopes is not the vast majority of the sample. Sometimes we can get closer to even. The last, the, the last two examples I showed are in the minority. Uh, most uh, most uh, isotopic distributions are more than one isotope, and one isotope will have a, uh, comprise the vast majority majority of the sample. But what I'm saying here is that does not have to be the case. So let's look at some questions and problems and possible test quiz or exam uh, problems we might we might get with uh, respect to isotopic symbols. I got some examples right here. If we look at this one in the uh, upper left hand corner, um, we can give an isotopic symbol and then ask uh, some questions about it. For instance, number of protons. Well, we look no further than that lower number. That is nine. Number of neutrons. Well, we subtract the upper number, the mass number, from the lower number, the, uh, the, the, the atomic number, and 19 minus 9 equals 10. That's the number of neutrons. The atomic number of that element, well, we could do a number of things. We see, uh, we see uh, that the elemental symbol is F. We could go over to the periodic table here on the upper right-hand side and see that that number on top is 9. That is the atomic number, which it is. Or we could simply look at, the, at realize that the, uh, that lower number on a, uh, an isotopic symbol is indeed the, uh, the uh, uh, atomic number of the element. And lastly, the name, well, here's, you know, F uh, is, uh, is our uh, elemental symbol. The name of that is fluorine. Our next example right here. Um, most of the time, uh, isotopic symbols are not given as, uh, given as ions because isotopic symbols, we're really talking about number of nucleons, uh, the, the subatomic particles in the nucleus. Ions are talking about an imbalance of electrons which surround that nucleus. But I do this here just so it, it helps to be able to keep a tally uh, of these things. And here I have Fe3+, 3 plus, 3 plus and, uh, and then we got some numbers over on the side. It's technically an isotopic symbol. So if we are asking number of protons, number of protons on that, we look no further than that lower number on that, uh, on that left-hand stack, that's 26. That's the atomic number. That is the number of protons, 26. Next one, number of electrons. And we have to think a little bit here. If we have 26 protons, and this three plus here tells us that we have three less electrons, which carry the negative charge, than protons. 
which carry the positive charge. We would, in our mind, would say, well, we have to have three less than 26 protons. It would have to be 23. Again, uh, the, the last question here, the mass number. Well, that's just a housekeeping tool. That's called the mass number, 56, so we write that down there. On to the next one. It uh, seems like I am imposing on you that a question mark is an actual elemental symbol. It is not. Um, just that's what we're going to have to eventually answer uh, in, uh, in, in, in uh, to one of these questions moving forward. But let's uh, take these one at a time. Number of protons. Well, that's that lower number, 16. Number of neutrons, that is 32 minus 16. Mass number minus atomic number, that's also 16. Atomic number, well, that's the same number as protons. We're putting a lot of 16s in here, sort of psyching you out a little bit. The name of the element, well, how are we going to do that? We always have our periodic table at the ready, and if we know that number of protons here on the bottom is the atomic number, we seek out on the periodic table atomic number 16. And we see that there it is. The name of that element is sulfur, and its symbol is S. Final answers. So this whole question of isotopes now brings us full circle back to that uh, atomic mass. Atomic mass given in the periodic table, which if we have our chemical symbol here, that's the number underneath. And we had some questions about the atomic mass. It's almost never uh, an actual integer. It's almost always a decimal form. And what accounts for that extra or, or lacking mass in there? And carbon, we had uh, the atomic mass is 12.01 atomic mass units. Where is that 0 0.01 coming from? And that uh, is best uh, answered by defining what an atomic mass actually is. An atomic mass is not an actual mass. It's an average. Specifically, it is a weighted average of all of the isotopic abundances and their different uh, mass amounts. If we look at carbon again, down, down here, we have our atomic mass over on the, the left-hand side, 12.01. Well, Let's look at our dis natural distribution of isotopes. Most of our sample, 99% of it, is exactly 12, exactly 12 AMU. But we have a smattering of heavier isotopes in there. Not many, but they add to the average weight of that sample. So our atomic mass here, given in any uh, given in the periodic table in, uh, with respect to any element is not an actual weighed number. It is an average, a weighted average of our, in this case, three different isotopes, three different isotopes. So we have to calculate an average. We have to do a little uh, calculation, shockingly. And, uh, and here it is. In order to come up with an atomic mass, if you don't feel like just reading it out of the periodic table, is that we have the we have to take the mass of one ice. So we've got the mass of our isotopes. Um, they're not given uh, up here, I should mention, but we do have the mass if we have the masses given of those isotopes, and then we have to multiply each of these separately by their uh, by their natural abundances. Now, this natural abundance of, of isotope A is multiplied by its mass. Um, it's said here it has to be in decimal form. We're going to address that in just a minute. We have to take it out of a percentage the way they're normally given, these percentages, and put that into a decimal. It's easy enough. 99% in decimal form is 0 0.99. So we have to do that uh, in order to uh, uh, actually carry out a calculation. So we have a, uh, the mass of isotope A times its abundance uh, in, a, in a decimal form, plus, after we take care of that, the mass of isotope B times its abundance in decimal form. And if there was a third uh, uh, isotope, like there is in carbon, we'd have the mass of isotope C times the abundance in decimal form of isotope C, and so on and so forth. Let's look at a couple of examples of how this uh, might be, uh, we might bring this about. Here's an example. Calculate the average atomic mass for chlorine. 
And what we're given down here is we're get, we have uh, two isotopes of chlorine and we have some tabulated data for each. We have the mass of each of their isotopes as well as the abundance of each of our isotopes. Now, this is assuming you don't, you're not looking at this and saying, I don't really need to calculate the average atomic mass for chlorine because that is the atomic mass. I'll just look at a periodic table. Thank you very much. Well, uh, bear with me here. Yes, you could do that, but there'll be some problems, notably the next example, where we're, we're, we're asked to, to, uh, to think outside the box on, with respect to that. Overall, we're going to use that same uh, equation that we saw the last time um, that, that's uh, somewhat uh, uh, familiar, and we're going to put together these, uh, these numbers. We're essentially going to be taking the, 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 this tabulated data and putting it together, uh, squeezing it into this format. Here we have mass of our isotope A, chlorine 35. That's right here. Here we have uh, our decimal form of the abundance, 0 0.755. Notice that's derived from 75%, 75.5% of the sample, just marching the decimal point two places to uh, the left, and we, and, and we get, uh, get that number. Similarly, the mass of isotope B times its abundance in, uh, in, in uh, decimal form, as we see right there. Rules of mathematics state that we are to uh, carry out multiplications first before addition. So we come up with these two uh, sub numbers and then simply add them together. 35.46 atomic mass units. That is indeed the number for atomic mass you will get from the periodic table showing that atomic mass of an element is not an actually measured uh, uh, system. It is a, a calculated amount. Let's look at another example. So this one will make us think a little bit, I think. Silver has two naturally occurring isotopes, Ag107 and Ag109. The natural abundance of one of these isotopes, Ag107, is 51.84% and its mass is 106.91 atomic mass units. What is the mass of the other isotope, Ag109? Well, let's bring in our equation. And we are going to uh, specify, so what is the mass of AG109? Isn't that isotope B? So that is what we're ultimately going to be solving for. That is implying that all of these other components here that we see are available. We have to, obviously, if we're solving for one unknown, we have to have all of the other knowns in there in order to algebraically solve for that. So let's put down what we do have. And we're gonna find that we're strangely lacking here. Now, this is what we're looking for. Yes, we have this number, this number with it. But in order to solve for the mass of AG109, I need these two values. And I don't seem to have that from the question. Now we've encountered problems like this before, whether things are hiding in plain sight or we can go off to another, uh, find, find the uh, answer in, an, in another form. So let's look at some, uh, some assumptions that, that are, 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 are being made here that, or that we can make here. Two assumptions. The first necessary assumption or rather observation is that um, if we wanna calculate the abundance of AG109 or isotope B, well, we have to realize that the, the statement was that silver has two naturally occurring isotopes, and we already have one of them. So they must comprise 100% of the sample. So if we subtract the amount of the other one, that will indeed give us this number uh, uh, that, that we need right there. So we could put that one in there. Notice I've changed it to decimal form. But also in order to uh, solve this problem, I need the average atomic uh, mass of silver. And what could we do there? Well, the second uh, necessary observation, we can just get that directly from a periodic table. And indeed, uh, we can do that. We would find that that is 107.87 atomic mass units. Now, we have... Uh, everything we need, and we only we can algebraically solve this for the mass 
of, uh, of that uh, second isotope of silver. Um, so again, I'll, I'll put this out here in, in algebraic form. Um, uh, basically what we need to do so uh, is to, you know, we combine uh, these two right here and we get a number um, and we, uh, we use that number, uh, you know, uh, to, uh, to, uh, against one another in order to get to the point where we are uh, slowly getting to uh, solving for what that mass of AG109 is, 108.9 atomic mass units. So I know I don't always say it, but this is the end of our uh, third unit of study. The next lecture we will start uh, into will uh, begin our fourth unit of study where we start talking about that third and most important subatomic particle really for chemistry, that of the electron.